there are numerous narrations in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sihr was done against him. Aisha narrates that Sihr was done on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he began to imagine that he had done something when he hadn't done it. The Prophet would wake up in the morning believing that he needed to do a ghusl. Means he was intimate, but he had not been intimate. So shayateen especially love to play with this area of sexuality. That's why dreams of a sexual nature, whether a man or a woman sees them, what we call wet dreams, whether ejaculation occurs or not, but all dreams of a sexual nature, all of them emanate from shaitan. And that is why the prophets, none of them can have these types of dreams. So dreams of that nature, they come from shaitan. Shaitan plays with our minds, men and women. Now, of course, it's not sinful. We are not held accountable for what we dream and what happens in our sleep. So in this case, our Prophet ﷺ didn't have a dream, but he thought that he had done something natural and allowed between a husband and wife. And Aisha would tell him, no. And so this was the maximum effect of the sihr. It did not affect the wahi. It did not affect his religion. All that it could affect, and it was the most powerful sahir alive at the time. His name is Labid ibn al-A'asam. The max he could do was to make the Prophet assume he had done something halal, and he hadn't done that halal thing, right? Now, had that sihir been done against another human, it might have killed him. But our Prophet the effect was so minimal that he assumed he had done something that was halal. So even the effects of sihr were not haram. The imagination that he had was halal. So Aisha says that he made dua to Allah and he made dua and he made dua to Allah. Then he said to me, he's speaking to Aisha, that I feel that Allah has inspired me how to cure myself because I saw a dream that two angels came, two people or two angels came and one of them sat at my head and the other sat at my feet. And the two began having a conversation. So the first said, what is the problem of this man? The second res responded, he has been mas'hur. Sihr has been done on him. The first said, who has done the sihr? The second said, Labid ibn al-A'asam. So the first one said, how did he do it? What material did he use? The other one replied, he used a comb and the hair that had been gathered on the comb and the outer skin of the pollen of the male date palm. And so he put some type of sihr inside this shell. The first one said, where is the sihr? And the second one said, it is in the well of Darwan. So the Prophet Sallallahu went to the place of Darwan and he returned and he said to Aisha, the date palms of this well, they look like the heads of devils. And the water of the well is dark bloody. And Aisha said that, did you take out that magic with which the sihr was done? And the Prophet Sallallahu responded in one narration, no. For Allah has cured me of that and I am I'm afraid that if I take it out, it might cause more harm if the people see it and whatnot. And so the well was ordered to be destroyed and covered up. We learn many things from this narration. First and foremost that Iman and Taqwa in and of itself does not necessarily 100% protect you from sihr. Rather, it can minimize the effects of sihr. We also learn from this narration that most magic occurs by using some type of body parts of the one upon whom the magic is done. So the most common things used are hair and nails and also clothing items. We also learn that one of the main ways to combat sihr is through dua to Allah. Because Aisha says he kept on making dua, he kept on making dua. According to another hadith, the angels recited Surah Falaq and Surah Nas. And according to another narration, Surah Falaq and Surah Nas were revealed because of this occasion. So we learn therefore that Surah Al Falaq and Surah Al Nas are of the most powerful cures for sihr. And both Falaq and Nas basically directly or indirectly talk about sihr. I seek refuge in Allah from the evil of those women who are blowing on knots. One of the types of sihr is to take some hair, to take some item and tie some knots and then do your incantations similar to voodoo dolls in our times, right? You throw a pin in and you do this. So all of this is types of sihr. 
I seek refuge in you from the evil of those that are doing sihr. And قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ مَلِكِ النَّاسِ إِلَّهِ النَّاسِ مِنْ شَرِّ الْوَسْوَاسِ الْخَنَّاسِ الَّذِي وَسُفِي سُدُرَةِ مِنَ الْجِنَّةِ وَالنَّاسِ General seeking refuge in Allah from the jinn. And the jinn are the cause of sihr. So, we are talking about sihr that is in our vernacular called black magic or the dark arts. You cannot have sihr without the jinn. Every sihr has to have jinn involved. Because in the end of the day, how does something happen? The magician has no power. The magician pretends that he has power. In reality, the power of the magician is nothing other than the physical, natural services of the jinn. And we understand that the jinn have, for some reason, agreed to help the magician. Magic is nothing other than what the jinns are naturally capable of doing. There's no supernatural, there's no mystical, there's no semi-divine. The jinns are not all powerful. Rather, Allah has given them strengths that He has not given us. And He has given us strengths that He has not given them. The jinn is basically not saying, Kun fayakun. Only Allah has that power. The jinn does not have what we would call genuine supernatural power. Whatever the jinn is doing, the jinn has the power to do physically because the jinn can enter the body and the jinn has access to the blood. As we know, the Prophet said, the jinn runs in the blood, right? He has the, the hiddenness, he can transfer knowledge, he can do this and that. And the jinn has other powers we might not know about. But it's physical for the jinn and not supernatural. So, all sihr is basically jinns doing their tricks. How do we combat magic? Remember that you are reaching out to another world and that is the world of the jinn. And you do not have the physical strength to combat the jinn. You only have one power and that is la hawla la qusa illa billah. Allah has the power over the jinn. So the only way to combat sihr is to reach out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah can nullify the sihr like He did to our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the power of the Qur'an is the most effective in eliminating the jinn. The jinns literally burn when they hear the Qur'an. And especially the surahs that the Prophet told us are extra special. Fatiha, Ayatul Kursi, the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, the entire Surah Al-Baqarah, our process and linked it to combating sihr. Falaq and nas right? All of these are especially powerful in combating sihr. Never, ever, ever fight magic with magic because it'll only get you more magic, more sihr. Some of the things are okay to do, inshaAllah ta'ala, not a problem. So to write the Qur'an, and it has to be Qur'an, and put it in water to drink. Not a problem, inshaAllah ta'ala, to blow the Qur'an onto something and give it to you. Again, if, you, if it's the Qur'an, not a problem as well. Even to write Qur'an as long as it is Qur'an and put it on the body, but you have to read it, make sure it is entirely Qur'an. All of it has to be Qur'anic or adhkar. Then we say it's permissible. But if there's weird stuff that you don't understand, languages you don't understand, scripts and symbols, you don't understand numbers, boxes, grids, all of this is communicating with the shayateen and it's not a part of our religion of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who are protected from sihr, uh, whom the shayateen do not harm. We ask Allah's protection, we seek Allah's protection from the evil of those who blow onto knots and from the evil of the jinn and the shayateen.